like to start off with uh, two or three, three little poems that we've produced. Um, Eve, I've written the uh, script to them, and she has then designed them, and we've produced a few copies of them that are available um, for purchase from there uh, during the break. Uh, 50 p, pick me up for 50p, some of the works of JMG, and uh, you can get signed first editions of these tonight if you want. Eve, thanks for doing those for us. Uh, these three little poems um, are as follows. Uh, this one relates to the 25th of January, uh, which is Burns Night. And, um, right. My love's not like some ruddy rose that's only sprung in spring. If she were nothing more than that, she'd be a sorry thing. Forget your burns, where wild delight is tempered by the weather. My love's a bonny evergreen, a sprig of hardy pepper. <laughs> Working the way through the year, we come to February the 14th. I'm suffering this heart attack. I'm smitten through and through and I don't think I'll recover and it's all because of you. is a very short extract from my play, Joseph and His Amazing Crystal Palace. Um, and it's to do with the marriage of Joseph. Um, he was the head gardener at Chatsworth. And down here, he was involved in London Road Cemetery and the like. And it's from the first play that I've put on in one or two schools in London. And now we've moved up to Coventry to be near the grandchildren and other members of the family. Um, I'm hoping we may be able to build up towards putting it on again uh, towards 2021, perhaps, with some of the schools. Anyway, this is to do with Joseph uh, on his, and his wife on their wedding day, basically. Love's a cockerel, can't stop crowing. Tells the sun, get up and shine. Love's the seed that we are sowing. Loves the no. Inside of knowing, I am yours and you are mine. This next one is based on these sort of things. The, uh, it's called Revive 45. As you know, they have a, an A side and a B side. Revive 45, A side. And this is what they would say. A side. You pick me up, you turn me on. For you I'll sing this little song at your command for just as long as you desire. You've given me a purpose, a direction. You've put me in a spin. I feel alive. You've plugged my centre hole and I'm under your control. The single that you've chosen to revive. I used to have this personal ambition to shine across the pop scene like a sun. No, it never came to be. Just by listening to me, you make me feel that I'm your number one. It's true at times I sound a little awkward. It's just a scratch. As you were bound to hear. Okay, I lack perfection when you take a close inspection, but if you like me, can't you turn the other ear? Don't judge me from this opening impression. It isn't that I've anything to hide, but who gets a total view when they're meeting someone new? It may be that I've got another side. B side. Now, I'm the side you don't hear often. <laughs> not as popular as A. Discontent with my position, not the type you'd overplay. 
It's pathetic. When you think about it, both of us are made the same. Just a mouldy piece of plastic, only different in the grain, like two fingerprints, that's all. Nothing much. And yet it's clear from this tiny fact emerges all the differences you hear. Oh, not that you will hear me often moaning how I was begotten. Well, when you hear my other side, I will simply be forgotten. When my better half is playing, and all you want is like relief, don't forget I'm close beside you, stealing your silence underneath. <laughs> so next one, um, I, I, there's a book written of poems written by Philip Larkin called Wits and Weddings. And there are two poems in that, uh, the Arundel tomb that I'll do next. But this one, he's, he, the Whitson Weddings, is he's on a journey from Hull by train down to London. And it's at Whitson, and there have been marriages going on all the way down, and, and the people are getting in. Well, using that as a basic idea, um, <coughs> I was wondering what it would be like to be somebody else sitting in that train. And this is called, in an English railway carriage. Two strangers, you and I, who come to, shame, to share this same compartment for a little while. We sit apart like dummies and observe each other secretly. I sneak a glance, then look aside so you may have a turn. When by chance our glancing coincides, we move our eyes straight down to see our awkward knees locked frigidly self-consciousness, or else to read, or seem quite unperturbed and look out of the window casually, uh, only to find our two transparent forms still far apart beyond the window frame, miming each move we make. And though they get it all the wrong way round, they still persist. These silent critics, wisely out of reach, who've come to mock our dumb performance. Now, there are times when I can think of nothing better than changing seats with my reflection. He's got the guts I lack to stare me down. I've never seen him look away. What stops me changing places is the pain. It's always there when he's around. I simply can't get through. We can't shake hands or even hold a conversation. He interrupts me every time, and I, when I'd rather listen, he shuts up as well. It's quite impossible. I may as well look through him at the fields and trees and flocks and herds and poles and wires and clouds and birds until they merge into a blur and I get weary eyed and bored. So I look back inside. We're still apart. You dive headfirst into a book. Now, I agree it's great to plunge in fiction, but come up at times for air. I wonder if you're quite as sunk as you appear. Or is it just a cover to remain uptight behind the sheets? Oh, I'm not implying you're a prude. You could be playing this game hard to gain some say in how the match is scored. To be honest, who wants to be ignored? I don't. Let's chat. Then I can check the guess I've made about your tone of voice based on the way you dress as from your shape of mouth. I'd find how nearly you're related to the person I'm creating in my mind. So how about it? My suggestion, speech. No, wait, I shouldn't interrupt your thoughts. You could be sick to death of nursing those who rattle on. Why give your time to someone else you fear might bore you with the weather, the cost of living, and himself? 
unless, like me, you travel blind within an English frame of mind. I'll have to speak to see. Excuse me, do you have the time, please? Having you. Having you about the house is good. It's cheaper on the electricity. When you walk in, you brighten up the place. You're warmer than a two-bar fire. With you for breakfast, lunch, and tea, I hardly use the cooker anymore. Having you beside my skin is good. It's cheaper on the clothing. I've cut my journeys to the laundrette since we began to wrap ourselves in such a simple fashion. Having you makes me feel real good. Having you makes me feel real. Having you makes me feel. Having you makes me. wrote a poem about a tomb that is in Chichester Cathedral. It's called an Arundel Tomb and it's the other quite interesting, I try and turn a very good poem that's in uh, the Whitson Weddings. It's the little book of poems. Philip Larkin, not aware, comes from Coventry, went to hell, no sorry, went to Hull and he's coming back in 2021 obviously um, when we've got our cultural whatever. Um, in 1976, um, I wrote a poem about Philip Larkin's poem, An Arundel Tomb. I was at the, the, at, at the Chichester Cathedral, where the tomb is, and the tomb consists of uh, the Earl of um, wherever it is, Arundel and his wife, the Countess, lying side by side and sort of holding hands. And uh, the famous line commenting at the end is, what will survive of us is love. And um, so I wrote, the, and I, I was there and I saw the poem, which was next to the tomb. And I looked at the poem and I looked at the tomb and looked at the poem and looked at the tomb. And I finally thought, he's got it wrong. And um, so I wrote a poem. And the poem I'm going to read out now is my poem to him, which I got a very nice reply from him. Um, in, uh, it took me about seven years to pluck up the courage to send the poem to him and uh, then I got a reply from him and in fact he died a couple of years later and I didn't realise when I sent him the poem that he was already quite very ill. But anyway, um, so uh, in 1976 I wrote a poem about Philip Larkin's poem in Arundel Tomb and in 1983 I finally plucked up the courage to send it to him. He sent me a pleasant reply. Last year, I, I saw in the Esk Valley Theatre upstream from Whitby a revival of a 1990s play that I didn't know even existed. It's called Laughing with Women by a chap called Ben Brown. I'm sitting there in this small village hall uh, with the, the professional actors, and to my surprise, the closing scene in the play uh, referred to the information that I pointed out to Larkin in my poem to him. So um, I called it a sort of time double take at an arable tomb. Um, I'm renaming it now, I think, as a Coventry Observer at an arable tomb. And uh, sometime in the next few weeks, the Coventry Observer newspaper are doing an article about it um, in more detail than you're going to get from me tonight. So this is a Coventry Observer at an Arundel tomb. Have you been to Chichester? Have you seen the tomb? Stand in the cathedral one quiet afternoon and read what Mr. Larkin wrote about the Countess and his, and her, and his squire. No, has, whoops, Countess and her squire. 
Now look at the tomb, and now again at the words, and decide if the poet's a liar. Observe the actual tomb, this symbol of eternal love. Which hand is it, the left or right, without the glove? He states the left, but is it true? From what I saw when I was there, unless I'm much mistaken, it's the other one that's there. Well, it's not what I expected. And it's quite a tender shock, discovering a mirage where you thought you'd seen a rock. Does it really matter? Who's to say a writer's bound by truth? Perhaps he simply saw the tomb the wrong way round. When there, no tomb, the sword has snapped. No doubt, some Tudor afternoon, a boy, his tutor's back was turned, leaned heavily upon the tomb. And also, a nose has been replaced with a slightly different coloured stone. Who knows? Perhaps these alterations were the sculptor's own. Jealous that time would break his work, he chose himself to be the rag. Like Prospero destroyed his book, Excalibur thrown back. Ah, what is truth? As Pilate asked. Things remembered? Things forgot? Is everything we know as fact mere speculation? Based on what? in my family who are older than me and people that are younger than me. The letter. Thought I'd sit down and try to write you a letter. Let you know how things are getting on. It's been, what, three years now? How time flies. You would hardly recognise the place. The rooms redecorated, the ceiling papers pasted back, and like the walls now painted white. The old enamel sink has gone, bought a whole new kitchen unit cheap. It's quite an improvement. I think you would have liked it. Oh, I've also had a go at the cupboard, finding all those little drawers with nothing but the folds of a 1920s paper. All that news kept out of sight for 50 years. I wonder how the story's ended. I took an axe and smashed it into firewood. Admired your craftsmanship before each stroke. It had to go, though, considering the rot. Most of your clothing, too, has gone. The wardrobes have been emptied. Your entire estate, save a few items, a watch, a chain, and a ring, have been scattered throughout the jumbled sails of southeast London. Because it is summer, the fireplace is full. I've placed the table hard against the grate, and now the mantelpiece is lined with books instead of clocks. Perhaps when winter comes, I shall return to your idea of soft armchairs beside an open fire. I had thought to end this letter with having a nice time, wish you were here, but I'm able to find your address. Is it really by that rose bush? in the crematorium, I know I am really only writing to myself. <laughs> that was Grandpa. This is someone a bit younger. Uh, when she was very much younger, Sally, from her plastic teapot, pours imaginary tea for her friends who've come to join us. Squirrel, panda, owl, and me. May you go on, may your teapot never empty. May you go on pouring pleasure for us gathered here together. Squirrel, panda, owl, and me. <laughs> Two little seaside poems to finish with. Joseph Paxton, always, who was the MP here, always had family uh, holidays at Scarborough, on the beach. 
Two mighty kingdoms, <clears throat> sighted on the sand, built in the time it takes the tide to turn, and flowing in between a tiny stream. Two fortresses, a thousand million grains, sand piled on sand, wide towers topped with flags, and wider than before, the growing stream. Two castles sighted boldly on the sand, shells for windows, seaweed on the walls. Two monarchs armed with buckets and with spades are digging trenches to divert the stream that will not be contained. They waste their time. The moats are overflowing. Each turns to leave, crying the other caused the tide to come. Above them, silent, out of sight, the moon. Through an evening, I am walking where the water meets the land, slowly pacing, gently pressing silent footprints in the sand, past a spot that two have lingered many hours, hand in hand, and the one wrote to the other, I adore you, in the sand. But the words are swiftly fading, for the night has intervened. The beach bereft of bathers like a slate is being cleaned. A child's mighty castle has fallen in the sea. His tunnel to Australia is filling rapidly, for the water line is rising. It will not, cannot stay. I stop, turn slowly round to find my footsteps. John, that was an excellent set up. I like, like the balance of humour and sentimentality. Very nice. So, uh, oh, so physical copies of John and Eve's uh, poems. They're just got here. They look really nice, and they're only 50p each. So I'd say it's worth picking up one or two. I'm definitely going to grab some. Uh, we're now approaching the break. Just before you go, uh, if you want to see what HC Mag is like.